Oh, I wish only a few simple pleasures. Give me but an occasional moment of contact with your senses. No one else need ever know. Let me feel but a small corner of your life when, for example, you are enraptured by the voices of your favorite podcasters. Is that not a small price to ask? <laughs> Gotta sign up for the Patreon for that, Baron. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till you see our feet pics. <laughs> <laughs> OnlySeach.com? OnlySeach.com. Welcome to Gom Jabbar, your guide to the iconic world of Dune. We'll be exploring the themes, philosophies, and characters found in the sandy depths of this vast universe, from Frank Herbert's groundbreaking novels to the adaptations on film and TV. My name's Abu. My name is Leo. And Leo, we're back. We are. <laughs> we made it. With a vengeance. With, with so much a vengeance. <laughs> Heaps. Four <laughs> tablespoons. Children of Dune, we're back with our second episode of the book club page by page coverage of this fantastic book. My God, it's so good. <laughs> it is so good and it's only getting better. But hey, it's a massive script today. We have a ton to get through. Yes. So let's tackle some housekeeping and jump right into this reading. As with all of our book club episodes, these episodes are 100% spoiler free. We are only going to discuss what happened through today's reading. So if this is your first time reading Children of Dune, you are good to go. Naturally, we can't help ourselves. We will dive deep for returning visitors. It's just what we do. <laughs> now, of course, the best way to support this show and help us continue doing what we do best is to become a patron at patreon.com slash gomjabar. You get cool benefits like completely ad-free episodes, exclusive access to our Discord server, and you'll get to hear these book club episodes as soon as they come out. As always, we must shout out our Kwisatz Haderach level patrons. Oh. Case Aiken, Nate Hyde, gents, thank you so much for your generosity. It means the world. Another fantastic way to support the show and get something kind of neat for yourself is to check out our merchandise offerings at gomjabarshop.com. We have socks, we've got shirts, we've got stickers and sweaters, a pint glass, so many fun little things that pretty much only Dune fans are going to understand. <laughs> we also want to hear from you, whether you're reading along with us for the first time or you're revisiting Children of Dune with us, reach out at gomjabarpodcast at gmail.com. Send us your thoughts, send us your questions. As we said last time, we plan on sprinkling in some dedicated mailbag episodes to focus on answering as many of your questions and messages as possible. So make sure to check the show notes for the full book club schedule and get that question sent to us before the next mailbag episode. Indeed. Well, with the housekeeping out of the way, y'all know the drill. Today's episode is going to begin with a summary of today's reading. Then we're going to dive deep on a couple of key takeaways. And finally, we've uh, loaded the oven, packed the oven with delicious, <laughs> nutritious spice morsels. That's right. So let's get into it. What do you think spice morsels look like? Very I large. kind of imagine them as like <laughs> pizza rolls. <laughs> like hot pockets. Hot pockets. Cold in the middle, <laughs> lava on the outside. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> That's right. Do not. Use a microwave to heat to reheat your spice morsels. <laughs> no, never. That's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> All right, that's housekeeping out of the way, folks. Let's take a short break, but don't go anywhere, because when we come back, we are diving deep into today's reading. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the break. Chapter 7 our first chapter of today's reading. In our first chapter, we are with Gurney and Jessica 
They're in a small room, having a conversation basically on two levels. One level of their conversation is totally audible. They're ha- talking back and forth with their mouths, like we are on this podcast. <laughs> because they know 100% that Alia has spies and that they're being listened to. The other level of their conversation is via the Atreides battle language, a.k.a. talking with your hands. We learn via their conversation that most of the people they captured during that initial welcome to the planet scene have been interrogated and almost all of them belong to Alia. They are Alia's people. No super surprise there. But what is surprising is that some of them mention in their interrogations Jakarudu. And Jakarudu is a place now that we've heard by a few different characters have talked about it. Yeah. And the people who said it out loud fucking died. (laughs) Like, (laughs) just immediately. And considering these people died just by saying the name of the place, Jessica's theory is that the captured people were conditioned to die if compelled to talk about it, which personally brings up some like super alarming possibilities surrounding conditioning. Like, can you really yeah. just condition people to die if they say a word? <laughs> that takes like pineapple as a safe word to a very dark place. Yeah. Oof. Nevertheless, Jessica's like, if it's out there, Gurney, they have to be in contact with the smugglers because there'd be no way for them to make money. So get in contact with your smuggler friends, see if any of the Tuics are still around. And uh, yeah, we'll see if we can get our way to Jakarudu. Now, they briefly discuss Javid, and then Gurney leaves. But not after telling Jessica, she'll be under additional protection. Jessica doesn't like it, but we get this beautiful, sad little aside. Jessica, quote, hesitated on the point of telling him not to send more guards, but she held her silence. Gurney's instincts were to be trusted. More than one Atreides had learned this, both to his pleasure and his sorrow. End quote. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. I mean, listen. Plays the balisette well. Charms the ladies. Makes a mean Mai Tai, and my God, his instincts are on point. And let's just not (laughs) talk about that time he (laughs) nearly killed her. (laughs) Yeah. No, it's okay. Nobody's infallible. We all make mistakes. We all make we all nearly kill the people we love all the time. Don't we? <laughs> all the time. Don't right? we? It happened just last week to me. It's Wait, don't we? <laughs> a what? I mean <laughs> Right? <laughs> right? Uh-huh. We'll talk about it off mic. <laughs> chapter eight. This next chapter introduces us to the preacher. Yo! I love this chapter so much. We've heard about the preacher time and time again in the book already. And now we finally, finally get to meet him. And there is a huge question hanging in the air, a giant elephant in the room. Yeah. Is the preacher Muad'Dib? Is this Paul back from the desert? Yeah. A lot of people think so. And there are a number of hints that perhaps it may be the preacher has burnt out eyes. If you recall what happened to Dune Messiah. Yeah. He's got a very commanding voice. He seems to know what he's talking about, which that that one I feel like people are projecting a little bit. But also, <laughs> here's something that works against this theory. He's being led around by a young boy. And the Muad'Dib that we knew back in Messiah wasn't blind, right? Like, even though he had the burnt out eyes after the stone burner, he could still use his powers to see perfectly well. So maybe this preacher character is not Muad'Dib after all. Yeah. We don't know for certain yet. We do know that the boy who is guiding the preacher around is named Asan Tariq, and he's about 14 years old. We learn a little bit about the preacher's presence here at this moment, and it's worth pausing here and pulling some quotes just to talk a little bit about what he looks like, because it is important. We're told that he's a lean wraith of a man who's wrapped in traditional Fremen guard and, quote, a still suit which bore the mark about it of those once made only in the siege caves of the deepest desert, end quote. Dang. So that's perhaps a hint as to where he comes from. We meet him here in Arakeen, but doesn't seem like he lives over in, like, the gated community of Arakeen, exactly. <laughs> no. We're told that basically, quote, 
this preacher was a figure from Dune's past, end quote. His appearance just screams old school Fremen from the deep desert. Mm -hmm. So in this scene, the preacher and Asan are making their way through the throngs of Arakeen, and they're basically closing in on Alia's keep, looking out over what is basically described as a bustling bazaar. Right. People are out here selling food and trinkets and souvenirs and the Dune Tarot. Hey! Which we love so much. (laughs) Yeah, such a great episode. We did a whole episode about that. Check it out. Mm -hmm. One guy out here is even selling cloth, rumored to have touched Muad'Dib himself. Oh, my God. Amazing. This is definitely where you can buy Muad'Dib bathwater. 100% (laughs) this bazaar right here. (laughs) Gamer Messiah bathwater. Nice. (laughs) Joke. Exactly. (laughs) And the preacher's review on this is zero out of five Yelp review (laughs) on this bazaar and on this planet in general. He hates all of this. Quote, the preacher's thoughts were mirrored on his face as he absorbed his surroundings. We have come to this, we Fremen. End quote. I think he's just a New Yorker. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Sounds like a born and bred Brooklynite, you know? (laughs) (laughs) He would definitely like slap a passing cart be like hey i'm walking here i'm the preacher <laughs> i'm the preacher i'm, the pre- hey! I'm never leading the prayers <laughs> never- paul <laughs> <laughs> now this is where the sand dancers enter the scene love them this is worth spending just a quick 30 seconds on because it's, so, it's such an incredible scene yeah the way it's described apparently around 50-ish people who are all tied together are dancing, just dancing the night away. And some of them have been dancing so long, apparently, that they are unconscious and just dangling tied to their fellows as their people around them are dancing. Cool. It is incredible. And we're, we're basically told that perhaps they've been dancing for literal days. Oh, cool. So like me at weddings. Nice. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Been there frothing at the mouth, right? They're frothing at the mouth. <laughs> yes. Me at once. Uh-huh, cool. Uh-huh. Been, <laughs> yep. And you know what? It's even funnier because I have witnessed this. We went to a wedding last year together. I warned you in the car ride. I was like, I'm going to be dancing. I'm going to be frothing yeah. at the mouth. It's going to be I great. I didn't believe you, but I should have. They <laughs> had to drag you off the dance floor. It was, it night, was a scene. Halfway through the night, you're like, oh, you're dancing a lot. I'm like, I do. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about this explicitly. <laughs> Oh, oh man. actually, so funny. And it was the wedding of the person who made our theme music. So Yeah, anyway, Lawrence. Shouts Lawrence. to Lawrence. Yeah, for sure. So why are these folks dancing? That's the question, right? It's not a wedding. If it was a wedding, they'd be justified in the mouth frothing and the dancing. Sure. <laughs> it turns out that this group of 50 people are all drugged up, and they're, again, foaming at the mouths and dancing until they literally pass out in order to reach some sort of enlightenment. This is a normal routine, something that happens here in this bazaar, and people are not shocked by it. Right. In fact, when one of these unconscious dancers suddenly wakes up and starts rambling out loud, he's screaming about some vision he's seen. He's telling people Arakeen is gone. It's been replaced by sand. Everybody just kind of laughs in the bazaar. Everyone thinks this is the funniest thing in the world, except for our boy, the preacher. Right. He's from Brooklyn. Nothing's funny in Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing's funny <laughs> with some fucking dancers <laughs> yelling don't about. Don't talk the- to him until he's had his coffee. <laughs> you don't fucking talk to me until I'm a coffee. <laughs> I'm the preacher. <laughs> that sounds like, all right, preacher. All right, let's go. Right. <laughs> so the preacher, of course, is just not having this. And we get th- just an incredible series of quotes and uh we're just going to read read parts of this chapter to you sorry <laughs> we're, this this is like half podcast half audiobook now we're inventing the genre yeah sorry not sorry though because this is fantastic it's fantastic quote he raised both arms and roared in a voice which surely had commanded worm riders silence the entire throng in the plaza went still at that battle cry The preacher pointed a thin hand toward the dancers, and the illusion that he actually saw them was uncanny. Did you not hear that man? Blasphemers and idolaters. All of you, 
The religion of Muad'Dib is not Muad'Dib. He spurns it as he spurns you. Sand will cover this place. Sand will cover you. End quote. That is Ah. 100% how I'm going to leave work from now on. (laughs) (laughs) Sand will cover this place. Sand will cover you. Okay, bye, Leo. (laughs) See you tomorrow. (laughs) See you tomorrow. Sand will cover you. All right. (laughs) Uh, What a scene. Yeah. You, You can imagine just the hush that falls over the entire bazaar. When the preacher yells out like this, too. It's amazing. Uh, It's just electric. Like, reading it, I was like, sure. But then I pictured it. Like, imagine a bustling bazaar, thousands of people clamoring, talking. There's the dancing. There's the guy screaming. Everyone's laughing. And for one person to be like, silence, and for everything to stop would feel like you're, like, witnessing a miracle. Like, that would feel so profound. Ugh. Love it. But wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah. The preacher's not done yet. <laughs> yeah, because right. just as he's about to walk away, a brave soul in the crowd who's probably new around here yeah. <laughs> straight up just asks the preacher the question we're all wondering. Hey, man, are you Paul Atreides or not? Nah? Yeah. <laughs> and the preacher stops and pulls out a human hand from his purse. Nice. <laughs> The theatrics with this guy are off the charts. I mean, I, I don't know about you, Leo, whether whether or not you think he's Paul or not. What I do know is that this man was a theater kid at one point <laughs> in his life. Yeah. What we don't see is he rummaged in his purse for a second, was like, okay, handful of glitter. No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I have my uh, – the. The, that screenplay I've been writing, that the, the you know, I'm going <laughs> to workshop next week. No, 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 not that. Ah, the human hand. Yes, perfect. The human hand. <laughs> yes. Uh, how long has he been carrying that around for just the perfect moment? I don't know. But this was the perfect moment. <laughs> so good. It's incredible. Quote, I bring the hand of God, and that is all I bring, the preacher shouted. I speak for the hand of God. I am the preacher. End quote is his response to the new kid asking if he's Paul. Amazing. <laughs> I love it so much. I love this character so much. The preacher's yeah. amazing. Uh, incredible. And we end chapter eight on this line. Quote, it was not the last time his voice was heard. End quote. And frankly, thank God. Mm. More of this guy, please. His stage presence is off the charts. Get him an Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think he'd want a Tony if he was a theater kid. But oh, true. He'd, he'd appreciate the Oscar, too. He's going for the EGOT, no doubt. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. I believe in him. Chapter 9 begins on Seleucus Secundus. Hey, Tony the Tiger. is <laughs> Tony the Laza Tiger. <laughs> and this is, it seems like minutes after Tony the Laza Tigers killed those kids. We are with a new character, Princess Wencysia Carino. Irulan's sister. Whoa. And buckle up. She's so much to deal with. <laughs> she's just a, she's a lot. Truly. When Sissia is with her Bashar, her Bashar aide, Ty Knick. Thoughts? Yeah, that's how the audiobook says it too. Ty really? Knick. Oh, yeah. fucking nailed it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ty Knick. And they've been watching their favorite show, Laws of Tiger episode two. The children get eaten. <laughs> we should establish quickly Wincisia's relationship to known characters. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wincisia, as Irulan's sister, is Shaddam the Fourth's daughter and mother to Faradin Carino. So the idea of killing the Atreides and putting her boy on the throne clearly pleases her. She's super into it. Tykenik suggests Faradin may be of kind of a different mind on that topic. (laughs) And we haven't met Faradin yet, but we can perhaps say that, like, Operation Tony the Tiger Kills the Kids is Wincisia's project on his behalf. Like, she's the one kind of driving this scheme mobile without his knowledge, importantly. Mm -hmm. They discuss the plan a little bit further. So... Tony the Laza Tigers are going to kill Leto and Ganema. Alia will be killed by Javid and his oh, operatives, who hello. apparently is in touch with House Carino. 
What? Dang. Jessica called it. Yeah, I was going to say. Shouts out to Jessica and her attention to <laughs> minutiae. <laughs> right. She's killing it. <laughs> the Lance Rad and Chome, meanwhile, will follow Prophet just wherever that is. And finally, there's the Fremen. <laughs> this is, by a margin, the dumbest part of this plan. <laughs> Tychonic will join the Fremen religion and convert Faradin, so the Fremen will accept him as their leader. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is just stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, I'll teach him Italian so that he's made the king of Italy. It's like, I don't know if you... <laughs> you got so much wrong in that sentence. Right. Yeah. Most of the plan makes sense until you get to this point, and then it's... <laughs> Honestly, I was like, it's literally unbelievable that they actually think this will work. <laughs> right. Well, with that out of the way, when Sissia turns her attention to what most concerns her, Faradin cannot learn about the Tony the Tiger, Laza Tiger plot. Clearly, he'd not be okay with it. He's got like, I don't know, morals or some stupid thing. <laughs> doesn't so, want to kill kids. What a fucking loser. Doesn't want to kill kids. What a coward, you know? <laughs> So, discretion is key. Now, discretion is so important that she decides, as one of the four people who knows about this whole thing, that Levenbreck that we spent so much time with, who's like, two days from retirement? <laughs> He's like, <laughs> one last job, and then it's off to Maui. Like, <laughs> this is fantastic. She decides he should die. Oh, no. Now, this is despite the fact that Tychonic is like, no, 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 like, He's a Sardaukar. They do not reveal secrets. What are you talking about? Meanwhile, she hits a big red button <laughs> and the Laza Tigers turn on him and, and basically like hunt him down. Now, when Sissia turns, and this moment is incredible, she turns as Bashar Tykenik draws his knife. She kind of tenses up. But he, he hands it to her, like handle extended to her, Offering her his knife to kill him. I mean, this is really a demonstration of the Sardaukar's legendary loyalty. She's like, no, no, I wouldn't kill you. You're one of the only people I trust. Also, you're going to have to kill your other guy, the, the pilot who's going to fly Tony the Tiger to Arrakis. You're going to have to kill him. And this is brutal because clearly from Tychonic's reactions, the guy, the Levenbreck out in the field who just died, and the pilot are both like good men, like good, loyal men who are trusted and capable, and he values them. Now, in a brief exchange, we get a new layer to this whole interaction, and it begins with Winsissia saying, quote, I leave that to you. I trust you, my friend. End quote. Hello. He responds by staring at her. <laughs> <laughs> just like 10 out of 10 social skills uh, I clearly went to yeah. the same school as him in learning how to interact with people like cool she plays coy quote surely you must know that who else can I trust since the death of my husband end quote this next thought gives us a much colder evaluation of this weird princess <laughs> quote he shrugged thinking how closely she emulated the spider. <laughs> it would not do to get on intimate terms with her, as he now suspected his Levenbreck had done. Holy quote, shit. Oh Mr. my god. Levenbreck, so close to promotion, you dog. <laughs> but also you got murdered because of it, so... Oof, still tough. Tough look. The chapter ends on a bit of a sour note. When Sissia acknowledges Tychonic's clear dislike of wasting good personnel, but in a way that definitely doubles down. She's digging her heels in. Quote, An army, she said, is composed of disposable, completely replaceable parts. That is the lesson of the Levenbreck. End quote. And with that, we have our clearest understanding of who when Sissia Carino is. Yeah. And having basically turned all of us against her, she leaves the room. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, and here I was thinking about wooing her. <laughs> I was going to get on but intimate I, I value my her. life. Yeah, <laughs> I value my life more than that. Damn. 
I have a promotion coming up, so probably I'll hold off until after the promotion, <laughs> and then I'll get on intimate terms with her. <laughs> she seems spicy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, scary and spicy. <laughs> yeah, you know, like Planet Arrakis, as it. <laughs> All righty. Next up, we have Chapter Ten. Yes, we are back on Arrakis in a private meeting between Jessica and Ganema, and this chapter is electric. True. We're not going to say too much right now in the summary because in a takeaway later, we have so much more to say about this exchange between Jessica and Ganema and just the subtext within subtext and all the layers at play here. So hang tight. We will be revisiting this conversation in a takeaway later today. But just briefly, Jessica and Ganema are here in a meeting privately, just the two of them, for basically the same reasons. Jessica, at this point, can tell that something is off with Leto, and of course she's worried that abomination may be the case. She has seen it in her daughter, Alia. She's worried she may see the same signs in her grandchildren. Ganema, of course, also knows what Leto has told her about seeing his prescient visions, and she too is concerned that he may be headed down that same path. Right. Jessica, in an incredible move, drops all of her defenses, all of her Benny Gesserit defenses, and is completely open with her granddaughter. Quote, Ganima, watching the play of emotions across her grandmother's face, marveled that Jessica had let down her controls. With catching movements of their heads remarkably synchronized, both turned, eyes met, and they stared deeply, probingly at each other. Thoughts without spoken words passed between them. Jessica, I wish you to see my fear. Ganima, now I know you love me. It was a swift moment of utter trust. End quote. Sheesh. Good Lord. <laughs> and to be clear, from the quote I just read, that part where Jessica says, I wish you to see my fear, Ganima says, now I know, now I know you love me. Not spoken words. Those aren't written in quotations in the book. They didn't say these things out loud. This is just the sort of subtext and almost like psychic connection that these two have with each other. Right. It's incredible. So that's sort of like the context and the vibe of this conversation where things start off. There's so right. much unspoken being said. There's such a deep connection between grandmother and granddaughter because of their abilities and their training. And they discuss both Leto and Alia and Abomination and share what they know about Jakarutu and all of the pieces that are currently at play so far in the book. So that's where we will wrap up the summary for this chapter. But again, we'll talk more about it later. Chapter 11. We join Alia Atreides. Oh my God, this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> we join Alia on the roof of the keep out on her usual pre-breakfast stroll. Now, Unlike a uh, pre-breakfast stroll that you or I may take, Alia is spending hers thinking on the nature of her existence as a pre-born. <laughs> uh, which, sure enough, I don't do that very often. I usually do yeah. that after. I just a post-breakfast thought for yeah. me. Same, same. Now, we learn so much about Alia's life in the opening few paragraphs of this chapter. And literally all of it is heartbreaking. <laughs> Yeah. We are going to, just like with the Ganema and Jessica chapter, we're going to be using this as an opportunity to really look at Alia's life and what we learn about her in her battle against abomination in the takeaways. But for now, it is enough to say that her life, from the moment she awakened in Jessica's womb, through childhood, puberty, and now adulthood, has been a nonstop struggle to maintain her identity and sanity. Yeah. And it's shocking to learn how much pain she's been in, really, and how much she's been going through the previous two books. On the roof, Alia looks out over the shield wall and tries to focus on the mundane. She's like, oh, yeah, look how it's changing, the dew on the grass, the, you know, there's going to be new grass that's being going to be planted, and this change is coming along. But literally no amount of thinking and no amount of this mundane can keep her other memories from just shutting up. Like, they are just constantly talking. Yeah. She thinks back to yesterday, when she had to judge a chome spy named Essis Payman. <laughs> Payman. 
PayPal. <laughs> PayPal? P- Pal? <laughs> PayPal? <laughs> Sponsored by either that or Digimon joke. He's <laughs> right. Paymon. Right. <laughs> Paymon. Paymon. The money pun. The money Digimon. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this Chome spy, instead of sentencing him to the dungeons, he was, like, super bold and kind of sassy with her. She was impressed by that. He's like, hey, you want to have a new job, dude? Not even an hour later, though, Javid, Javid, who we have recently learned works with the Carinos, suspicious, (laughs) rushes into the room and goes, you know that Digimon Paymon? (laughs) 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 No. You, you know that Chome Spy Paymon? <laughs> he was overheard muttering a verse from the OC Bible about witches. And Alia's like, that fucking Digimon! And she orders him <laughs> executed immediately. Her thoughts of Paymon are interrupted when a nearby guard calls Alia to breakfast and we get a sense of just how tired she is. Alia sighed. She felt small choice between hells. The outcry within her mind, or the outcry from her attendants. All were pointless voices. <laughs> Ruth, Jesus. <laughs> but persistent in their demands. Hourglass noises that she would like to silence with the edge of a knife. End Jesus. Quote. God damn. <laughs> First of all, worst boss. <laughs> yeah. Oof. You're like, we, we made you breakfast. She's like, I want to kill you with a knife. <laughs> You're like, God, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Rude. But also, I'm like, I'm an introvert. Like, I get it. Like, that's... Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I've had that thought. Oh, these pointless voices, you know? Uh, so many. <laughs> she waves the guard away in annoyance and is suddenly overwhelmed by the pleading voices of her other memories, the internal clamor. She lays down on a nearby bench as the cacophony inside her grows to an unbearable level, drowning her. Literal agony. Quote, She wanted to scream against them and against all the other voices, but could not find her own voice. End quote. Now, in kind of a funny aside, one of the palace guards notices her lying on the bench and remarks to another guard, quote, Ah, she's resting. Oh my you God. noted that she didn't sleep well last night. It is good for her <laughs> to take the Zaha, the morning siesta, end quote. <laughs> These fucking guards out here. Fire this man. This guard sucks. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, she's taking a little nappy nap. She's like grimacing and like twitching <laughs> on the bench. Oh, she's dreaming. <laughs> Uh, tough look. I think, again, we joke, but there is a serious through line here where this reveals to us how internal this all is. Right. Like, yes. Out From the outside, you would think nothing is wrong with Alia. This is truly a battle she's fighting on the inside. That is such a good point. Yeah. As Alia is lying there in literal agony, losing her mind, a voice powers through the rest and presents itself. Quote, my dear child, I will help you. You must help me in return. End quote. Who could it be? Enter. From stage left. Uh Uh-huh. Big boy Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Oh, no. Holy shit. That's not who I was wanted. (laughs) (laughs) Who did you want? Dwayne the Rock Johnson. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. That's who I wanted. Keep the voices at bay, Dwayne. With your big old smile, your lovely shoulders. (laughs) Now the Baron shows up and tells all of the other voices to shut up, and they do. He creates a silence for Alia, and it's like this relief, this balm on the sunburn, the aloe vera balm on the terrible sunburn, the cold (laughs) lemonade on a hot New York City summer's day. Or yeah. literally my booth right now. It's so cool. right. it's 84 degrees the, outside. The fresh Mai Tai handed to you by your lover on the Caledon Beach. He's so good on the battle set. <laughs> <laughs> Baron makes his sales pitch. Listen, all I want is just brief control of your senses so I can feel the pleasures of living again. Perhaps while you're in the arms of a lover. <laughs> okay. That's all I want. 
<laughs> and what will Baron Harkonnen's horny desires cost? Well, his payment will come in the form of advice and guidance in matters of state. And, listen, of course, he'll silence the other memories and stop them from taking over. The second part of that, that I'm going to end the agony you've experienced since childhood, and I'm going to let you sleep easy for the first time in your life, is just, it's unbelievable. And of course, Alia talks about in this chapter, or thinks about, first seeing Baron and being like, that is the last person in the world I want to acknowledge as part of my other memories. But like, there he is, right? Right. Where's Dwayne? <laughs> I was promised Dwayne the Rock Johnson <laughs> <laughs> in like a tight-fitting Hawaiian shirt. Like, what is this Baron <laughs> here? <laughs> and for good reason, right? She She has reservations about working with him for good reason. He's the guy who nearly killed her entire family line. But... She was losing her mind a few seconds ago in agony, even though it looks like she's taking a nap. And this is a sweet deal. And to give her a tease, to be like, listen, I know you haven't accepted yet, but let me give you, let me give you some insight. I know you suspect Javid because of like the whole payment thing from yesterday. So what you should do, young Alia Atreides, is take Javid for a lover and then fucking stab him. Just knife the <laughs> shit out of that guy. Oh, my God. And wow. It, it's almost funny when, like, boiled down that way. But look at how the Baron describes the kind of moment of climax. <laughs> Ew. Quote, when you have him helpless, then, in your bed, convinced that you are his thrall, you will ask him about payment. Do it jokingly a rich laugh between you. And when he admits the deception, you will slip a Chris knife between his ribs. Ah, the flow of blood can add so much to your satis... End quote. <laughs> oh my God. Ollie is like, yo, fucking t TMI, bro. That's <laughs> gross. Dude. Yeah. Oh my God. Baron's like, I get it. Girl, I get it. You've never done that. <laughs> You've never knife to lover <laughs> while orgasming i get it it's weird i'll do it i did it all the time it's my favorite thing to do just give me momentary control over your body and i'll do it for you and she's like what no no but he persists he's like listen i'm dead i'm gone i'm an illusion you're alive there's no way i could ever fully take you over. And listen, it's just temporary. It, as we've agreed, it has to be done, right? And listen, at the end of the day, even if I could take you over forever, all of your attendants, all of your friends, all of it, like Jessica's around, Leto and Ganima are around, everyone would recognize that I have taken you over and that would mean both of us die. So obviously I can't do that. I don't want to die again. I've already done that once, right? It's really a convincing pitch. <laughs> it is. I, I, and again, to your point from earlier about the Baron being like this incredibly smart guy, we talked about it in the first book. This again is like kind of an airtight argument, right? Like we have no reason to believe anything he's saying here is not true. Right. She's hesitant. She doesn't trust him. She has no reason to trust him, et cetera, et cetera. But you're right. It's an airtight argument. And he tells her exactly what she needs to hear. He's sensing her insecurities. He's seeing her doubts. And he's addressing them in a brilliant, tactful way. And it's so sad. Because ultimately, at this point, it's clear to us that Alia has no one in her life to talk to about things like this. She has no one to yeah. talk to about this. But she also doesn't have anybody to comfort her like this. She's never told anybody about the suffering that she goes through. And here he is providing her this kind of shoulder to cry on that she's never had before in her life. Even Duncan is often distant because he's a Mentat Zen Sunni Tleilaxu Gola. He's got a lot of <laughs> shit on his plate. <laughs> and would he even understand? 
Like maybe Jessica would get it because she's got other memory, but she's deeply prejudiced against abomination. Right. She can't talk to Ganima and Leto. They haven't been through spice agony, so they don't have any of what she's dealing with. She has no one. It's, it's so tragic. The chapter ends with Alia clearly warming to the Baron's ideas, although not yet kind of fully committed. She hasn't signed in ink. She commands the chief of her personal guard to bring Javid to her quarters for a very important private meeting. Uh Uh-oh. Close the door. Play (laughs) a movie in the living room so that you can't hear. Very important. It is genuinely a heartbreaking chapter. And it's one yeah. that uh, gives us insight into Alia's condition and it, something that I, to this point, like I didn't really understand. So anyway, that's our chapter 11. Totally. And again, we're going to be talking much more deeply about Alia's life and the nature of abomination a little bit later in the episode in our takeaways. Let's wrap up our summary. One more chapter to go. Mm. In chapter 12, we find ourselves in a cavern with Marie's. His son, Asan Tariq, recall him from the preacher chapter, Mm -hmm. and six bound prisoners all lined up for execution. Asan is apparently here to undergo a test of manhood, as Maurice explains. Quote, among the cast out, we have a special test for manhood. One day my son will be a judge in Shulak. We must know that he can act as he must. End quote. Okay. A lot of words there we don't know. (laughs) Yeah. One of the prisoners protests, naturally, saying that he came out here to the deep desert as part of his holy pilgrimage and that Maurice and Hassan have no right to kill him in cold blood. Right. And Maurice claps back with an absolutely savage response. Quote, you came in search of a personal religious awakening? Good. You shall have that awakening. End quote. Why does it sound like a Holy threat? Holy shit. <laughs> Damn, Maurice. Chill. Yeah. Through this scene and through this conversation, we learn that Maurice and his son are apparently part of some group who call themselves the Cast Out. And the prisoners recognize them as the water stealers of legend. The ones that were thought to have been wiped out at Jakarutu. So there's definitely some sort of bloody and painful history here. Between the cast out, Jakarutu, it all kind of ties into that legend we've been getting hints about throughout the book. We don't know the full picture yet, but we're starting to get an understanding. Right. After exchanging some ritual words with his father, Asan steps forward and kills all six prisoners. Credit where credit is due, though. Most of these prisoners are total badasses in these final moments. They accept their fates in classic Fremen fashion. Quote, only one soft-featured city Fremen protested, squalling as the youth grabbed his hair. The others spat at Asan Tariq in the old way, saying by this, see how little I value my water when it is taken by animals. End quote. (laughs) Yo, llama techniques. Love it. (laughs) Incredible. I'm going to start spitting near my own enemies. (laughs) Yeah. This short chapter then ends with Maurice congratulating his son for having passed the test of manhood and becoming a man among the cast out. And he also reminds us on, hey, the preacher, don't, don't tell him about this. Let's make sure he never finds out this took place. He doesn't need to know about the six murders you did today. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where our reading today ends. On that bleak note. An incredible set of chapters. Once again, a lot of ups, a lot of downs, high emotions, and I can't wait to talk more about it in our takeaways. Such a great, great set of chapters today. Indeed. So let's get into our takeaways right after a quick break. Stick around. Try not to kill six people. if You can help it. (laughs) And we'll be right back. Welcome back, folks. Let's now get into our takeaways from today's reading. And actually, Leo, I'd love for you to tackle this first one because you were pretty hype on this Jessica and Ganema conversation from earlier. Yeah. And we wanted to take a couple of minutes here 
to really dive in line by line and break down all of the subtext and layers within layers within layers as grandmother and granddaughter have this private conversation. Yeah. You know, the chapter with Jessica and Ganema is dense. And it does a lot to catch us up with two of the most prominent characters in the book so far. Now, it's fun throughout this chapter to see some of the kind of benefits of other memory as an active element in the scene. Jessica goes through the litany of fear and Ganema's like, oh yeah, that helps. The litany of fear, that's cool. <laughs> Even though it's like internal, <laughs> she's thinking to herself, must not fear, fear is my killer. Ganema's like, that's my favorite line. <laughs> 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 Terrifying. But it's because Ganema understands Jessica's internal voice so thoroughly. It's not that she's psychic. She has her own internal pocket, Jessica. She captured Jessica back on Route 10, right out of Pallet Town, and <laughs> understands Jessica's every thought and kind of the way her mind works and every thought and experience that Jessica had up to the moment of Paul's birth. And this is great, you know, show-don't-tell writing from Frank. And it is fun to see Jessica, who's normally so poised and so confident and so in control, it's fun to see her being completely thrown off by being transparent to someone. And it's also this being transparent to Ganema that prompts Jessica to take that giant bold step we talked about earlier of dropping her defenses, which is so crazy. Yeah, what a move from Benny Jesuit Jessica. Like, throughout this chapter, she has to constantly fight her very natural instinct, something she's done her whole life and has been trained to do, of hiding everything right behind this, like, Benny Gesserit training, behind this mask. Normally, that's like a superpower, right? And it's part of what makes the Benny Gesserit so effective on the political stage. Here, it continues to get in the way of this open and honest conversation she's trying to have with her granddaughter. Right. We get a few really incredible quotes that show us the significance of this choice, both from Jessica's perspective and from Ganema's. Quote, not since those loving moments with her duke had she lowered these barriers, end quote. Uh, Oof. So sad. That is so sad and so beautiful. Yeah. Another quote, Ganema, watching the play of emotions across her grandmother's face, marveled that Jessica had let down her controls, end quote. Shocking to Ganema that her Benny Jesuit mother would open up in this way. I imagine in this moment also her internal Jessica is like, Jesus, what? Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Because again, Ganema knows Jessica up to the point of Paul's birth, that Jessica would lower her defenses for anybody other than Leto Atreides. Shocking. Absolutely. That's a great point. And even a little later in the conversation, Jessica is struggling to keep these barriers down because they keep popping up. It's instinct. Quote, Jessica blinked, realized that the barriers had been creeping back in place, dropped them once more, end quote. It's this reflex she has to constantly fight. Yeah, it's a major effort. And while this is key to Ganema believing Jessica's love, right, we get that unspoken exchange, it is also worth remembering throughout this that Jessica sees it she does this on instinct because it's the only way to get what she wants in this moment, which is honest answers and open, honest communication. Right. Not to be too cynical about it, but she has an agenda here. And this is the most frictionless way of getting it is to just be open with her granddaughter. Always. And Ganema is also kind of on edge because Jessica brings up the human test. She, you know, she says, you'll recall we put Paul through this human test with the gum jabbar. <laughs> heard hey, of heard of it to test whether or not he's human and whether or not he has that kind of human control. We can't really test you and Leto because you both have Paul's like the lesson Paul learned like internally. But she still wants to bring this up because although it's clear she trusts Ganema and believes that Ganema is still human and not abomination yet. She's not sure about Leto, because Leto seemed to be hiding something. Now, Ganema 
is reminded in this moment, talking about being cynical about Jessica. She is reminded of an important quality of Jessica. Jessica is Benny Gesserit through and through. Quote, For a moment, memory-driven, Ganima saw her grandmother in a different light. What this woman might do of the driving necessities of that early conditioning in the Bene Gesserit schools. It raised new questions about Jessica's return to Arrakis, end quote. Mm. We've talked about it before, but Moheim nearly killing Paul with the gum Jabbar, it was also a test for Jessica, right? Was Jessica, as a Bene Gesserit sister, she had defied the Bene Gesserit breeding program that was 10,000 years old. Is she lost to the Bene Gesserit order? Is she lost to the sisterhood? Or was she still human? Is she still able to do what must be done? Jessica was, in that moment, willing to let Moheim kill the sole heir of House Atreides. Was willing to let Moheim kill her son. Right. And that's a crazy thing to think about. Like, Jessica, for all of our how much we know that she loves Paul and she loved Leto Atreides, and now we see that she loves Ganema and Leto, there's this element of like, Jesus, she was willing to let someone from the Bene Gesserit order just kill her son. Ganema calls this out, quote, Love wouldn't stop you from destroying us. Oh, I know the reasoning. Better the animal-human die than it recreate itself. And that's especially true if the animal-human bears the name Atreides, end quote. Oof. Imagine being called out so brutally by your <laughs> nine-year-old granddaughter. I know. <laughs> Ganema interrupting her. It's like, but before you talk, let me just point out, yeah, you would fucking kill me and Leto in a second if the yeah. sisterhood ordered it. Nevertheless, this doesn't end the scene, as it probably would if I were one of these people. I'd be like, well, fuck that, and then I'd leave because I don't like confrontation. <laughs> <laughs> the, the acknowledgement aside... Both Jessica and Ganema know that they have to work together. They have to be collaborative. And right now, they have to kind of identify this path forward. Right. And, and they, at this point, kind of get to the core of the conversation, what they're here to talk about. Leto, abomination, what's going on? And Ganema, on one level, assures her grandmother that nothing is wrong with Leto. He's not abomination. He is having these prescient dreams, which is a bit problematic, but it's nothing like what's going on with Alia. Right. And she explains their theory that it's the spice trances, the spice overdosing that Alia is constantly doing, which is making her succumb to her other memories and to abomination. This is something that her and her brother have been very careful to avoid. That being said, though, Ganema does reveal that lately Leto has been a little too curious about his aunt. Like, right. he, he's starting to talk and wonder a bit too much about Alia and Abomination. Quote, She works a strange attraction on Leto. He agrees that she is beyond hope, but still, he finds a way to be with her and study her. Mm hmm and it's very disturbing, end quote. Hmm. That's a big revelation from Ganema here. Yeah. Big red flag. Yep. <laughs> Think back to Leto and Ganema's conversation in one of the earlier chapters. Quote, They already were calling her abomination, Leto said. Don't you find it tempting to find out if you're stronger than all of those? No, I don't. Ganema looked away from her brother's probing stare, shuddered, end quote. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yikes. The fact that Leto's kind of like, well, maybe we can test the waters. Let's dip our toes. And Ganema's like, no, we mustn't. That's a big red flag. And it's obvious to us that Leto is, is perhaps risking some of what Alia did as well, or at least thinking about it. He maybe hasn't acted yet, but he's thinking. Yeah. Like, it's clear from that moment that Ganema, not only in attempting to maybe sway her twin brother into not taking any risks, is taking all of this way more seriously. The risk of possession, the risk of abomination. She's taking it way more seriously than Leto is. Which is, again, not to say he's being careless, but 
he's curious. <laughs> he's right. He's careful, but he's curious. <laughs> right. And look, we all know that quote about the cat and the curiosity. The cat slipped the knife into curiosity's <laughs> ribs at the moment of, and uh, it was so good. <laughs> <laughs> that one or is there a different quote uh th- this chapter ends with a one-two punch from jessica's thoughts and i think this is so important and i think this is maybe a little bit easy to read through quickly first up ganima is still repulsive as abomination and second of all leto has to be separated from her and trained now this chapter when you read it can make you sympathetic, if not a little wary, towards Jessica, right? Like she's, clearly she loves her grandkids. Clearly she's afraid. She gets a little manipulative at times. I love you. Remember, I love you. It's like, okay, you, the more times you say it, the less I trust you. <laughs> but nevertheless, you feel sympathy for this character. At the end of the chapter, despite the love, and with what Ganima said in mind, Jessica would still kill Ganima. If she, it was clear she was becoming abomination, like without hesitation. Right. And importantly, as per the Bene Gesserit instructions, Leto has to be separated and trained. What? Mm-hmm. She has an additional motive here. And what that is, we're not sure yet. But the fact that she's sitting in this conversation, this open sharing conversation with Ganema, and that doesn't come up is like, okay. She is using this vulnerability, showing Ganema that she's afraid, showing her that she loves her as a means of gathering information, but she's not being forthcoming. She's not meeting her halfway. Ganema's probably not expecting her to. <laughs> she's got shifty, shady Jessica as an other memory. <laughs> so she's like, ah, I know my grandma's shifty and shady. But still, what an incredible chapter that in one, on one hand, makes us sympathetic towards Jessica and understand her motives as a character, but also we know that she would do crazy shit at any point if it's right. ordered. So, <sighs> children of Dune, baby! <laughs> We're in it. We're in this We're book. in it now. Yeah. Okay, let's take a few minutes to talk about our second takeaway from today's reading, because we must talk about Alia and Abomination and what we know thus far. We've learned so much in these opening hundred pages of this book about preborn, about other memory, about prescient abilities. So much that, frankly, I think even Paul Atreides himself had not learned yet. Right. Yeah. And so let's talk a bit about Alia's life and then a bit about what that tells us in regards to Abomination. Alia, as we discussed earlier, has been battling against other memory her entire life. And it sounds like barely keeping it together. Right. We learn that growing up in the siege, she was surrounded by spice. And this, in fact, made this fight against other memory so much more difficult. Quote, Melage could not be escaped in a siege warren. It infested everything, food, water, air, even the fabrics against which she cried at night. End quote. Excuse me. (laughs) That last bit there, cried at night. Remember, she's a baby. She's a toddler when she's in the siege growing up. Yeah. That's a heartbreaking image to imagine this small three-year-old, four-year-old crying because of the voices in her head. Like, I think we make the mistake, I personally do, 100%, of seeing this toddler acting not like a toddler because she's got thousands of years of human experience but even the most experienced person in her other memory is still a human with human feelings and emotion and even as an adult someone calls you a freak or gives you like a shitty look when you didn't do anything to them feels bad yeah and i do think about like even though she's got perhaps millions of years of experience to draw upon she still got young hormones her brain chemicals and her neurochemistry is still a certain way in the same way that leto can't play the balisette perfectly because he's still got young hands yeah so you think about all that emotion 
all of that trauma, understanding deep psychological wounds and understanding cruelty for what it really is mixed with like being a child. <laughs> it's just awful and something we don't see at all. Definitely. There, there's something to be said about your physical real world experiences versus what you know, like mentally and emotionally. Right. If those things don't match up, yeah, that that is fertile ground for a psychotic break, which we see Alia undergo. Totally. We also learned that throughout her childhood, Alia had been winning Pyrrhic victories against these other memories, just barely, barely holding on to a sense of her own self. And even this sense of self was constantly intruded upon by these other lives. We get a real sense of Alia's isolation as she's growing into puberty, still fighting day in and day out with no one to help her, not even her mother. Here's a heartbreaking quote. Who would understand the help she required? Not her mother, who could never quite drive away that specter of Bene Gesserit judgment. The pre-born were abomination. End quote. Yeah. Holy shit. Yes, she had her mother with her in the siege in the desert as a child, but it doesn't sound like Jessica was really there for her in the way she needed at that young, sort of fragile age, dealing with this incredibly difficult other memory problem. I love you, Mama. Ew. I mean, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So it's, it's obvious the relationship has always been quite tense. And e even if there was sort of like basic physical love and uh, like care there, what I'm sensing is Alia never felt truly close enough to her mother to tell her some of her secrets as far as other memory is concerned, as far as her pre-born condition is concerned. Right. Like you, you can still love your parents and appreciate them, but not necessarily be close enough with them to like tell them everything that's going on in your life. Totally. And I get the sense that that's perhaps the relationship that Jessica and Alia had growing up in the siege back in the first book. Well, we also see, like, Hurrah really seemed to be Alia's, like, primary carekeeper. You know, like, yeah, Jessica was busy with Sayadina shit. She was <laughs> the right. mother for the Fremen. Meanwhile, we also see Hurrah being fantastic with Leto and Ganema. No fucking kidding. She's like an expert on raising uh, pre-born children. She is the galaxy's <laughs> foremost expert on yeah. mothering pre-born children. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, shouts to Harat, the most underrated character in the book. Uh, she's about, We need some Harat merch. <laughs> <laughs> now, fast forwarding through the events of Dune Messiah, once Alia is given the regency, we're told that the pressure of rule was too much. And she set aside these fears she had of other memory, all of these battles she was fighting, and basically gave in. She opened herself up to these inner lives because she needed their help. She felt so alone and so isolated. Yeah. And now she had been handed the largest empire in human history. <laughs> Easy. It's a tough situation to be put in. So it's clear to me, like sort of reading in between the lines, Alia was pretty much left high and dry. Like, completely out of her depth, handed an empire that she perhaps was not equipped to rule and was never really meant to be hers to begin with. Like, the line of succession was supposed to be Paul and then his kids, et cetera, et cetera. Like, right. Alia was never supposed to rule this empire. And she's been abandoned by her family and anyone that would support her. I mean, even other memory Jessica in her own head has abandoned her. And we learned that after that abandonment, the other voices got louder and more aggressive. It's tough. Alia was seemingly just set up to fail on all accounts from the start. She was never truly given the support that she needed to battle her inner demons and to rule an empire that was never meant to be hers. I was going to say, can you imagine your first day at work and you're like, no, tell me a little bit about the job. And they're like, oh, you're ruling thousands of planets you know like thirteen thousand planets <laughs> and you're like cool cool uh tell me about the last person well it was your brother um uh -huh. i have some numbers for you here uh he killed let's see 61 
billion people. So you've got some enemies. Just want to put that out there. Uh, cleansed some planets. Anyway, you'll do fine. Uh, I'll be in the other room if you need me. And then you hear the door lock and you're like, well. <laughs> right. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> For sure. Like it's, I think the point we're trying to make is it feels like an impossible situation. Yeah. Who the hell could handle this? Certainly not Dwayne The Rock Johnson. That's for sure. <laughs> Perhaps the only person who could handle this. Yeah. Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Those yeah. pecs. He was on stage right. Like Baron came stage left. He was stage right. Yeah. Those pecs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's maybe our first ever glimpse at Alia's life, which, again, to our point from earlier, we focused so much of the first two books on Paul that Alia's trauma went completely unnoticed. And it isn't now until Ch Children of Dune that we learn just the absolute horror that she dealt with day in and day out all through Dune, all through Dune Messiah. And it's continuing to be a struggle for her here in Children of Dune. Right. So now let's kind of pivot for a few minutes here and consider what we've learned about preborn and abomination and think back on the Leto Ganema Jessica conversations. Because now we have sort of a fuller picture. We have Alia's entire life experience. We know what the twins are going through. And we have a better understanding of, of what it's like to be preborn. Right. And we're getting characters literally actively theorizing <laughs> about these things. Yeah, we're getting exactly. We're getting conversations. And it's helpful. It's helpful to kind of hear these things. The twins are theorizing Alia has this problem, is dealing with this shit. And again, they're sympathetic to her. They're like... We're not envious of what she's had to deal with. She has to deal with this stuff because of her spice overdoses. And maybe also perhaps she had no parents to defend her. And it seems from this chapter that both of those things are true. <laughs> Good job, Leto and Ganema. Your theories are correct. <laughs> or at least that's Alia is kind of affirming these yeah. theories. You know, she's confirming. The spice-heavy lifestyle she lived in the siege made battling with the other memories extremely difficult. And when the other memory of her mother abandoned her, again, disgusted by her own daughter and the possibility of abomination, it's clear that any maybe form of protection that her mother being there would have provided her fell away. Leto and Ganema were talking about their other memories as almost personas who could stand guard well, her guard quit. <laughs> her guard <laughs> retired to her other memory Caladan for other memory Mai Tais. Yep, uh, yep. Brutal. Which allowed someone like Baron Harkonnen to fight through. And though it's clear that the twins haven't yet succumbed, I mean, part of it's just like they have the safeguards. They haven't been taking too much spice. They haven't risked the spice trance. It seems like they're even wary of dreaming, <laughs> right? Like, yeah just cautious of seeking memories and thinking and reflecting. And they have Paul and Shani as other voices, as other memories, living within themselves, guarding against the clamor of those other voices. Yeah. It's really cool to see the questions we had. We joked in the last episode about how the book starts off with so many questions and very few answers. We're starting to get some answers to these hypotheses. Right. And it's giving us such great insight into the world building and into the experience of a preborn person and to, into the experience of a preborn person who is succumbing to abomination, as tragic as that is. We are now starting to understand why. Although we, we got some answers regarding questions we asked last episode. Now we've got like a thousand questions about Jokarudu <laughs> and all that bullshit. <laughs> right. So many fucking new questions. Yeah. Frank, uh. <laughs> keep it coming. <laughs> <laughs> now, to wrap up this takeaway, sort of knowing everything we know now about Ali's childhood, about the nature of abomination and how it comes about and what safeguards exist, a quote from today's reading really stuck out to me. Mm. It was a thought that Jessica had about her daughter and knowing everything we know now. It's so sad. Quote, Jessica cupped her hands over her eyes, thought, even love can't protect us from unwanted facts. And she knew then 
that she still loved her daughter, crying out silently against fate. Alia, oh Alia, I am sorry for my part in your destruction. End quote. Oh my God. Oh my God. So sad. So, so terribly sad. And so in conclusion here, it is clear that Alia has lived a heartbreaking life. She is truly one of the most tragic figures in this whole story. And as dark as all of this is, I think the message of Alia's life thus far is beautiful. It shows us how much our loved ones matter in our lives. Friends, family, neighbors, dogs, their support can change the course of our lives. And as I was sort of doing the research and reading these chapters and writing the script for today's episode, I couldn't help but imagine what an alternate life would have been like for Alia. One where in the siege, she got the support of her mother, opened up to her about other memory and the torment she had day in and day out. Perhaps when Paul rose to power, she was more open and honest with Paul. Paul maybe took her under her wing, told her everything he knew about prescience. Right. Maybe this family could have solved their problems together, saving Alia from decades of torment and fighting for her sanity day in and day out. There perhaps exists another Alia out there who's not in this situation. Right. It was just something I couldn't stop thinking about, like how much of her circumstances were a result of other people's actions and other forces that were outside of her control. Truly tragic. Yeah. Also incredible how that basically this one chapter catches us up on a character's experiences across like 600 pages of novels. <laughs> like I can now go back and reread Messiah with a whole new insight into internally what's happening for this character who's at all of these like bureaucratic meetings and who's making fun of Corva, that piece of shit. And who's, <laughs> you know, there for so much looking down from her little spy hole as Paul is dealing with running an empire. Yeah. It's beautiful writing. Well, that is our takeaways from today's reading. Y'all know what's coming next folks. I think I heard the oven ding. <laughs> Bing. After a short break, we're going to dive into our spice morsels and wrap up today's episode. Don't go anywhere, folks. Welcome back, everybody. Oh, I have a tray full of spice morsels for you. Mm, they smell so good. Let's do it. Let's get into it. The first spice morsel. Oh, no. This word. <laughs> Kralizek. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really? think that's right. That's how they say it in the audiobook. Yes! Two for two, baby! <laughs> the Typhoon Struggle. Ooh. From today's reading, Muraz says, quote, Our judges cannot forget Jakarudu and our day of despair. Kralizek, the Typhoon Struggle, lives in our hearts. End quote. Yes, Kralizek, the Typhoon Struggle. Great name for an EP, if you're looking for an album <laughs> title. But what is it in Dude? What the heck does it mean here? Well, luckily, later in the book, Muraz defines Kralizek for us. Quote, Kralizek? That wasn't merely war or revolution. That was the typhoon struggle. It was a word from the furthermost Fremen legends, the battle at the end of the universe. End quote. Which, mm, love me some mythology. I love it. So cool. <laughs> in short, Kralizek is the Fremen word for an apocalyptic war, a legendary apocalyptic war or kind of struggle, event, conflict at the end of the universe. And of course, uh, Ragnarok is the first thing that comes to mind for me because I like Norse mythology quite a bit. But lots of religions have these sorts of endgame moments, these giant conflicts that either end the universe or in some cases kind of reboot it and restart it. Ragnarok, Armageddon, etc. So, Kralizek, the Typhoon Struggle. <laughs> Could also be a good Yu-Gi-Oh card. <laughs> I <laughs> summon shit. Kralizek, the Typhoon <laughs> Struggle. <laughs> That's an amazing Yu-Gi-Oh card. Holy shit. <laughs> Up next, Agamemnon, 
the ancestor of the Atreides. Mm, take me to Greece. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't be the only one that heard Agamemnon's voice in that cacophony that Ali hears. Quote, I, Agamemnon, your ancestor, demand audience. End quote. <laughs> Love his bravura. <laughs> Love Hell it. Yeah. Just a throwaway line sort of thrown into that Alia chapter. Right. So let's break it down. Agamemnon in Greek legend was the king of Mycenae. He was famously married to Helen, who was then famously taken by Paris, Prince of Troy, which very famously kicked off the Trojan War. <laughs> wow. Okay. If you've seen the terrible but also kind of great movie, Troy... It's you not learn terrible. About this. <laughs> it's just a good movie. <laughs> it's so inaccurate to the actual story. Oh, yeah. It's not a <laughs> nonfiction documentary inspired by true events. <laughs> but Brad Pitt looking good. It's fucking Brad Pitt fighting. It's great. <laughs> yeah. I, I love the movie, but it's also inaccurate. Anyway, what, what are we talking about? Agamemnon is in that movie as well. What does Agamemnon have to do with Dune, though? Well, this all but confirms to us that the Atreides are descendants of the Greeks. And more specifically, they are direct descendants of Agamemnon himself. And just in case you're like, uh, maybe Ali didn't hear this right. Maybe the voice is wrong in her head. <laughs> it was Agamemnon. <laughs> Different guy. <laughs> Different guy. Uh, cousin of a cousin. No, Ganema confirms this later in the book in, once again, a spoiler-free quote here. We Atreides go back to Agamemnon, and we know what's in our blood, end quote. There it is, folks. We've confirmed that the Atreides have Greek origin and are, in fact, direct descendants from Agamemnon of Greek legend. Yeah. And I'll wrap up this Spice Morsel by just reminding our listeners that we did an entire episode about the long and storied history of House Atreides. Yeah. Go check that deep dive out. Trust us. The history of this great house is not what you expect. It's incredible. There's at least one human who gets thrown in a literal zoo. <laughs> it's <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Our next spice morsel for you tastes like death. It's the death still. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> it's gone bad. We've heard the term death still literally since the first book. Been thrown around. And on a basic level, we know that it's a device that the Fremen use to reclaim the water of a body. Right. But as per usual, the Dune Encyclopedia, if you wanted to know two things about them, if you wanted to know four things about them, it offers you a thousand things about them. <laughs> Way too many things about them. So buckle up. <laughs> From the Dune Encyclopedia, we're given a basic description of your classic death still. This is vanilla. This is the one that they try to sell you immediately. Uh, based on your credit available. Right, no no upgrades on this one. Right, no upgrades, no bells and whistles. This does not have Bluetooth, but it will get you to where <laughs> you're going. Quote, the Death Still's major components were two plasteel vats, one within the other, plus a heating device and a condensing system. End quote. The Dune Encyclopedia does give us the added details that the space between the two vats was filled with maker oil, which... Huh. Not, like, how? how? What? Do you, <laughs> do you take, like, the baby worm and... How do you get maker oil? Like, what the fuck is that? But whatever. It was then <laughs> heated up. The whole contraption was heated up to temperatures reaching 200 degrees Celsius. What is that in American numbers? 392 degrees Fahrenheit. Or, right around oven temperatures to heat up your frozen pizza, naturally. Mm -hmm. You put in a body in the death still. 425, preheat the death still. You want to preheat it so you <laughs> get that liquid quickly. The liquid in the body began to boil, and the vapor was channeled through a, a coiled condenser tube. The condensation was then collected and measured. Now, there were two kinds of death stills. One was a large one built into a room, often found in sieges, right? Big, cumbersome thing. Two was a smaller, portable one for distilling on the go. <laughs> In case you were out and you were like, oh, shit, I forgot. I have this corpse with me. I've been meaning to. <laughs> meaning to. It's been on the to-do. 
Whatever remained at the end of this process of the body, after all the water had been captured, was, quote, treated with utmost care and buried in the earth to share with Shai Hulud, end quote. Wow. Worm treats. Beautiful. Yeah. Dried, <laughs> raisin human worm treats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yum. They're favorite. All righty. We did it. Another book club episode in the books. Good Lord. Thank God for Spice Morsels because that was a heavy episode. Thank you, everybody. You made it through so much emotion. You did great. You did great, listener. Truly, truly. A jam-packed set of chapters with so much happening. And honestly, a lot of plot lines being set up. Yeah. Between the Carino plot, Tony the Tiger, <laughs> preborn problems, hashtag preborn problems. Yep. A lot of things are being set up here in the book so far, and I can't wait for all of these threads to unravel. So for the next episode, listener, make sure you've read up to page 148 in the paperback copy of the book. Of course, if you have another edition, make sure to read through the chapter that ends on the sentence, quote, it worked, Leto said, end quote. Yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. I don't know what that's about. We'll have to do the reading. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what worked, but it did. So what, whatever it did, did. Well, friends, there is no real ending. It's just the place where you stop the recording. But this podcast is always one step beyond logic, so help spread the word of Muad'Dib and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the other shows on the Lord Party Podcast Network on lordparty.com. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at lore underscore party. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, whoever controls the podcast controls the universe. We'll see you on the Golden Path.